Hi everybody, and I'm very pleased to be here and to have heard what I heard this morning. I think it's really useful because like everybody else, we're all on a learning curve. But I have to say that I feel like a little bit of a fraud because uh, we're really very conscious in Women's Aid that we're at the very beginning. And I've got to tell you a little bit about our journey, but it is a very small beginning. It's hopefully in the right direction and what we want to do is to keep checking in with people. But I wanted to just to let you know a little bit about Women's Aid. We celebrated or we marked our 40th anniversary last year. And we came like so many groups in Ireland. Um, I was talking to somebody who used to lunchtime about how organic things are in Ireland. And it really comes together when people are interested in an issue, come together and start to develop a service and get a little bit of money and it grows. And if they can get a bit of money to do this, that bit grows a bit. And so it's always kind of a bit of an amorphous thing that follows a little bit of funding, but trying to go where you want to go. But at the same time, I suppose it was a good year for us because we could look back on what we have achieved. And we're really proud of a lot of the things that we have achieved in terms of the services. And as the director, women will often come up to me and say, I was in a really bad space 10 years ago. And I'm really happy now. I'm in a completely different world. And that is all we really, really, really need to know. Um, and it is the kind of asset test for us. I mean, yet there's a lot of other information that we need, but that is the asset test. But the reason I think that, you know, that Women's Aid has become an organization, and we're not unique in this, is that every day we have a national free phone helpline, and we listen <coughs> to women's stories. And we listen to them trying to find the words and trying to find a way to talk about things that are very distressing and very shameful. And from those stories, if you like, the way I see Women's Aid, it's a two-handed organization. And we listen to what's going on the ground, what's happening. And we try and feed that into the other arm of our organization. So our services are listening to that. And that's fed into then the work that we do in terms of training, the work that we do in terms of awareness, and the work that we do in terms of policy. And that's, I think, the strength to me of the organization is there is that really strong connection all of the time. So if somebody comes up with an idea and policy, they have to go and talk to services. If something is coming up in services, they have to be able to give the policy people enough information to see, you know, those questions of how big it is, what can we do, how we can sort it. And I suppose, um, the other thing that I think that was learned fairly early on in the organization was that, that the ethos and the principles of the organization, um, this was working a second ago, hold on. It's not working now for some reason. Just, sorry, did I inadvertently do something that I just... Yep. We're good again. Okay. What did you do that I'm not doing? Sorry, <laughs> did you <ever> come back? Carol <laughs> down. Carol down. down. Yeah, that's the one I'm pressing. I was using those kids for me. Ah, there Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, there's a number of principles that we we developed fairly on in the early or in the organisation, and that we documented them. And I, the two that I've highlighted, I suppose, are the ones I think are more pertinent for today was that we understand the trauma of the violence because we've heard of the trauma, you know, we've heard it uh, so often. And, but we recognize that each woman is an expert in terms of the, the experience that she has and that we need to listen to her. So we don't see ourselves as the expert or with all of the knowledge, that she's the one we're relying on when we're talking to her about a safety plan, what's the level of danger? And research backs that up, that this, this, their, her sense of danger is the, actually the most accurate assessment. You can do a lot of tick boxes, and I'm sure the Gardaí are very familiar with other risk assessment tools. You know, there's DASH in the UK and all of that. But really, she will have a very accurate sense of that. Even if the abuse is only emotional up to that point, that if she says, I think he's going to kill me. Or, you know, he keeps threatening he's going to kill me, and I think he's really capable of it, that kind of thing. And I suppose the other thing we were always really conscious of was the additional barriers, in a sense, that, that some women experience. And the way I've seen that in a very simplistic kind of way is 
that you're trying to create a ladder from some, for somebody to be able to travel on from where they are now to somewhere else, somewhere higher and better and safer and whatever. But for a number of women, <coughs> there's going to be some of those rings missing. And for many women, there's going to be a lot of those rings missing. And that can be because of class, it can be because of geography sometimes, it can be because of age, it can be because of uh, ethnicity, it can be because of cultural stuff, it can be a whole range of things, and disability is one of those things. So you need to think about that as an organisation. And that's sometimes really challenging because, for example, one of the things that we would be quite not obsessed about in Women's Aid is that we would answer all the calls that come through to our helpline. And that's a big challenge, to meet all those calls, to answer all those calls. So you don't often have the headspace, if you like, to think about the women who are not even getting to, to call you. And I suppose one of the things that I found really interesting about some of the things that were said this morning was that whole idea of orality. Because why we don't have statistics for it, we know that women with other disabilities use our services. Um, women who have mobility problems, women who have sight problems, but they're in a position where they can pick up the phone and they can ring us. And that has been not the case for women who are deaf. Now we've had a tech service for a long time and I'll talk about that. But I suppose the other thing I think is that the more what we're trying to do as an organisation is to listen to what <coughs> women are saying themselves and to bring their stories out because the isolation that surrounds something like domestic violence is huge and it's actually really common. So the more we can break down those two things and make a connection so that women who are experiencing it realise they are not alone that this is something, like we know from Irish research, that it's one in five women who will be affected by domestic violence in her lifetime in Ireland. Now, I couldn't find anything on, UK, on uh, disabled women, and that's not because it's not there, it's because I wouldn't have a huge amount of time to do research at times, but what I could find was UK <coughs> research, and it showed that for women with disabilities, that increases to one in two. So in addition to having perhaps issues in terms of class, perhaps uh, issues in relation to if she's a traveller, a whole range of other things, the frequency, the threat, the level of threat is also going up. So you're talking about women who we really, really should be connecting with and supporting. And I suppose one of the things um, right, I wanted to talk about, and this is from a case study from the UK research that was done about 15 years ago, but I'd say it still holds. And it is very much the kind of thing that we'd hear from women, not deaf women, this is a deaf woman, but the, it's, a, it's a recurring thing that we hear about. So the, this woman is saying, in the evenings, I'd be exhausted. Being deaf is hard work, you know. You have to concentrate so much harder, and it's tiring. And he'd be furious and slap me and kick me awake. And he'd say, like, don't you fall asleep on me. I want a wife, a real wife not an old woman. And you know, it was sex all the time, twice a day, and he would shout at me and hold me down, and I hated it, I hated it. And when women start to talk to us about abuse, sexual abuse from intimate partners, they very often don't see it as rape. They would say th things like, he puts a pillow over my head, he holds me down, I don't get a choice in this, or whatever. So that it's, it's something that, again, it's another human <coughs> thing, if you like, in Irish society. And I think, like a lot of things, in addition to that sense of isolation, we still are steeped in a culture where so much it, there's so much shame. And that is always somehow attached to the victim. The victim feels that sense of shame, rather than it being the other way around. And all of those things make it much more difficult. So if, if women who have the ability to speak, to connect, to have you know access to resources, etc. Find it so difficult to talk about an issue like this. I can't even begin to imagine how much more difficult it can be for women who don't have that. And we know from the National Crime Council did some research in 2005, and what they said was that a third of victims of domestic violence never tell anyone. So that means they never tell their closest friend. They never tell a sister, 
or a neighbour or anyone. So they carry that, that, that burden of a secret. Because secret, I think the thing about taboo, I used to try and figure this out years ago, but I think the power of a taboo is the fact that something is made to be secret. And that isolates you if you have to carry a secret. And for an awful lot of women, they will be told, you tell anyone and you're dead. You're dead, the kids are dead, I'm getting in the car, I'm going to crash the car with the kids in the car, and in your head, it. So that secrecy is huge, and all of that makes it really difficult. So I suppose we've been aware of this as an organisation for a long time, but we have found it very difficult to make progress in terms of this is a list of, of one of our sets of strategic actions to look to build the accessibility of women's aid services. So there's about a dozen, a dozen here. This is in 2002. So you can see, you know, that we're here today to talk about a model of good practice. It has taken us such a long time to get to this place. And I think, you know, we have been able to progress some of these, but really at that point in time as an organization, these were sets of women, if you like, that we knew we needed to be able to improve our services. And we had to do particular things, but it was really difficult to be able to progress that. So what was happening really was we were writing funding proposals, we were trying to find out what was out there, we were trying to connect with people. And in the meantime, in ter I suppose there was one particular thing that we found that was really helpful when it came to the work that we did with the Irish Deaf Women's Group, who are an amazing group of women. And in amongst these as well, was we were just aware of mm. migrant women. And in 2002, it was less of an issue than it has been over the last number of years. But even at that stage, what we could see is in our support services, we had about 20%, which then grew to about 25%, which has grown to about 30% of the women that we saw were migrants. Mm. And they were women who could speak English. So we knew that there was obviously loads more women out there who could not contact us. And going back to that whole thing about shame, we knew if it's hard to talk about it anyway, how much harder is it to talk about it in another language? If you can't talk about something in your mother tongue, it must be just yet another kind of barrier. So we tried to find a way around that. And in the intervening years, we found a service that was used, it's used by the UK police and uh, domestic violence services, it's called Language Line. And it's been brilliant, like once we got the funding, it has been absolutely amazing. And it provides a service that is available within about 15 seconds. And all you need to know is that the caller wants, to sp wants an interpreter in a particular language and we can set up a three-way conversation, or a four-way conversation, and we've linked with the Gardaí if somebody arrives into a station, or if our refuge, or whatever it is we need to connect with. We can set up those conversations. And this service in the UK, because it's a much bigger population, is able to provide that service for 170 different languages, which is more, <laughs> like when we started off in this whole thing about migrant women and how do we connect with them, and, you know, I can't remember who it was said, oh, you probably need about six different languages and listed those off. And we, ha we got leaflets printed and they're up on our website. But the thing we've learned about <coughs> the language line is you're always going to be surprised. So the very first call that we got from in, on the language line was Albanian. Nobody in Ireland said to us, you might have to talk to somebody or listen to somebody in Albanian. The, <coughs> so it's always that thing. And in the year following the year that we got the funding, we provided 88 calls in 19 different languages. And that was about two thirds of those were, I'll have to check this because I'll get these figures wrong, but about two thirds of the call are used in EU language and the other third used in a non-EU language. So you had languages like Aramaic, Arabic, Bengali, Dari, Farsi, Georgian, Kurdish, Mandarin, Russian, Somali, Thai, and Yoruba. So I didn't even hear the names of some of those languages before. So I would imagine that those communities are very small communities. And the other thing that we had learned was because when somebody would ring our helpline very often, they would come for a support visit. 
we had had situations where a woman would come in, we would have gotten an interpreter from her community, her language speaking community, and she'd come in and we'd let her know who it was and once or twice she would have even heard them speak and she'd just go, no. It was far too dangerous because a lot of women would live with that death threat that if they were going to leave this relationship, so they would either not trust that person or the person, you know, they would just feel a, a level of threat from them. So the, I, I think what worked for us then was this is, this is a service that's in the UK, so there's far less links, and the whole issue of confidentiality is much safer. These are all professional people, they're used by the police there, so confidentiality is sacrosanct. So we had learned that over a period of time, and I think that was very helpful because when it came then to our connection with the Irish Deaf Women's Group, they're an amazing group of activists, absolutely. And their, our first interaction with them was when they contacted us to say they were organizing an event during the 16 days of action against violence against women. And shortly after that, we got some funding to provide talks to women's groups, mothers and toddler groups, older women's groups, whatever it was. And we got invited to speak to two women's groups. And one of them was out in the deaf village and it was with the Irish Deaf Women's Group. And at that, there was a discussion about, okay, these are issues, because there's very often there's disclosures. The person who goes out from women's aid needs to be able to handle a disclosure appropriately to talk to somebody, etc. There was a discussion about, you know, because we're always interested in that, you know, what would make our service better? And they were very clear they wanted a service in their own language. That plain text English is not good enough. And I think there's something really profound when you start to pay attention to that, that you have to do better than that. And I think, you know, up to a certain point, you kind of think, oh, it's out there, it's in English, anybody can, if you can read, if you can write, which is a major assumption anyway, but it's going to be accessible. So thankfully, we were able to, to work with them and uh, the leadership really came from the Deaf Women's Group. They scripted, developed <coughs> the story, Siobhan's story, which I'll move on to. Uh, and they, what we had, we had done before is we had developed, we had redeveloped our website a number of years ago and we decided that we would look at, we have kind of a, a theory that we use in training about where a woman is at and what her needs are. And we designed our website more or less around that. So we had grouped particular pieces of information into chunks that were fairly accessible. And we saw women as the primary users. Obviously, people come in as academics and media people and no disrespect, but you guys are really good at rooting stuff out. So you don't need to, it to be immediately accessible to you, but we needed the website to be immediately accessible. So we've, we've translated those into a range of different languages. And this is where we did it in terms of the Irish Sign Language. And um, Siobhan's story is the story that was scripted by the, by the Irish Deaf Women's Group. I think it was, it was Amanda, was it Amanda? Who, who was involved in it? It's part of the acting of it as well. Sorry, it's Amanda Coogan. Amanda Coogan, yeah. So, and, it, and they scripted it very particularly to their own experience, which is, again, really important because case studies do have a universality sometimes, but also about making it real for the people that need to know that. And then in addition to that, the kind of things that are available are there's stuff about, you know, um, do you need help? Are you in immediate danger? What are the warning signs of an abusive situation? What is domestic violence? Safety planning? women's aid support services, going to court, getting help locally outside Dublin, etc. So there's a, basically the information that is available for all women is available in, in Irish sign language. And I think that, that that the kind of significance of that didn't really hit me till I went to the launch of the, the ISL out in Deaf, Deaf Village. And I thought, that's great, we, at least we have this, we have the, the things. But there was such euphoria about having this equality of access to that simple piece of information. This is only like, it's not even the door. <laughs> you know, it's not even getting in the door. 
But there was such a sense in the group that I thought that was quite amazing, that it made such a difference to feel that you're equal. That it's, sometimes if you're busy in the, the world that I am, you, you don't really understand the depth of that. And on that night, I was so pleased to be there and to learn that and to realize the significance of that level of equality, just having that. Because there's a whole further you know, stage to go through. And I thought it might be useful just to talk to you a little bit about that. Because I suppose the other thing is, as I said, one of the things that we would see as being really, really important is confidentiality. So in women's aid, unfortunately, you know, we have, we have sent this information out to all of the other domestic violence services and the links and let them know about this but we don't know how well some of them can respond because a lot of, of domestic violence services are seriously cut through, through the recession. They've suffered from lack of investment in the first place. So how well they can respond, we don't really know. There's been no audit of that. But at least this is there now and anybody who needs to use it can put a link and it's, 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 it's up there. It's a good start is really, I suppose, what, what I'm trying to say. But the other thing is because of our learning in terms of language and the, the, the language line and other things, we knew that confidentiality was really, really important. So when we're booking a signer, we're very careful to always ask for a female signer because of the potential connections. We also never put the woman's name on the booking form. So we keep her anonymous all the way through. Now if she prefers to come with somebody who's going to sign for her, that's fine. But we would see it as our responsibility <coughs> to provide the signer. And then we'd also see, see it as our responsibility that if we're accompanying her to court, that we liaise with court and say to the court, and it's not our responsibility to do that, but at least to let them know that a signer is used. And to, to try and start at least to provide some sort of equivalence in the services. So, as I said, I still feel a bit of a fraud because I think we, you know, this is a very, very small start. We have provided, mm -hmm. you've got, I've left out cards there. We also published the, um, the cards there and I'll close this, sorry. We have, um, it doesn't matter anyway, I have posters, but I have, we, we also published posters and we published these cards to highlight the fact that we have a tech service. So just to tell you a little bit, bit about the tech service, we have a 12-hour helpline. We're going to be going 24 in 2016. The tech service is checked every couple of hours. It's not checked, in the, it's not answered immediately in the same way, but it is checked regularly. And there's a text back. Now, text is very limited. I mean, we have to get better. You know, I hope technology is going to develop to help us getting better. Because sometimes, if you look back over some of the texts, it's not always obvious if somebody is deaf, if it's just somebody else that's using text, and you're never going to know that. In, in terms of communications, it's something like that you're not going to know. But also, when you're talking about an issue like this, what you're trying to do is to, to build a connection, you know, to, to open up a space for somebody to talk about something, and text isn't great for that. So it's good to make that connection, but you're trying to link in with somebody then in the way that suits them so that they're, you can set up a, a support session for them and you can have an interpreter. But I think it's at least, as I said, it's, it's a beginning, it's an important beginning. And I suppose it's a model for the Garda website, for you know, a whole range of different websites to at least, maybe that's one thing, is that at least if you have certain levels of information, that are available in sign language, that that can make a difference. So I hope you find that useful. That's all I have to say for the moment, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>